slide two. I'm recording this now. Oh, just, okay. We're excited to have Jonas, um, the business exec, uh, creative and the author of Sell the Truth as our guest speaker. Uh, Jonas, would you be willing to introduce yourself and your team and briefly tell us about yourselves and your uh, before your presentation and just give us a, a little bit of a history as to how did you come into uh, this space of blockchain and Hyperledger? And then afterwards we can have a uh, Q and A session. So without further ado, I would like to um, present you, to you, Jonas. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, with me, I have Hugo, my colleague and Mats. Uh, and we will do an introduction uh, soon, but I, first I wanna say thank you so much guys for inviting us. And uh, I realized that it might be a bit early for some of you, so thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be able to share a little bit about our brain children, Snow Driver, and uh, play it forward. Uh, but before we start off, however, we get it, I, we thought we might want to get in the mood uh, with our core passion, which of course is, is music. And uh, my colleague here, Mats, is going to play a tune for us on this unique instrument called Nickel Harpa in Swedish which is a fascinating uh, instrument and, uh, and it's many hundred years old. Not his instrument though, uh, he built that one himself. So Mats, what, what, what do you plan to play for us? Well, I, I'm a traditional folk music musician in Sweden and uh, I play folk musician music, of course, but I also play pop and rock and I combine that. But now I will play a old Swedish tune, maybe a couple of hundred years old, so you can get a clue of what I'm doing. So this is it. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's outstanding. Thank you. That's a great introduction. Yes, thank you. Very unique, Jonas you. and Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, I thought we'd also give you a, a sort of an introduction of where we come from and how we ventured into the whole uh, blockchain music space from a personal uh, point of view. And uh, I will start off. And uh, <clears throat> uh, to me, uh, music always felt, I thought, like uh, something more real, actually, uh, than everyday life, even. And uh, it was as if music was able to connect with the essence of my very being. As a kid, I was drawn into these fascinating imaginary worlds of bands like Adam and the Ants and Twisted Sister, Motley Crue, Wasp, uh, on the one hand, and the soothing and comforting landscapes of easy listening music by, for example, Roger Whittaker, uh, or the older records that I found in my parents' collections from Elvis Presley, Polanka, and Bobby B, et cetera. I knew I wanted to live in this world of music, uh, one line among many that has stuck with me is from Twisted Sister, actually, and their song, King of the Fools, which goes, better a fool than just a clone, which resonated so strongly with me. I wanted to live in this world on my own terms. I played in bands, I wrote songs, I developed my singing, and I got a reggae deal. But I also got experience that the music industry is all about something else that I had somewhat overlooked, money. And that the competitive culture in the industry can be cutthroat serious. So after some time, I realized it was time for me to move on and ventured into advertising, communication, strategic brand development, and management consulting in a career as an entrepreneur. And I have enjoyed that journey very much. 
And then a few years ago, when I got in contact with the blockchain space, I felt that familiar spark of potentiality. There was an ideal of freedom, creativity, and the redistribution of power. Fantastic. So I took part in conducting uh, a few ICOs and other blockchain-based projects. And now I feel like I've come to sort of full circle, connecting with my younger self and the wonderful landscapes of music, combining my experiences into an attempt to bring something both wonderful and useful to the world of music. Hugo. Hi, everyone. And so I'm also a musician, but I became a musician when I was uh, maybe, I, I began playing music when I was maybe six years old and by playing piano. And music has always been a part of my life. Um, whether it's by playing it or listening to it, I've always enjoyed it. And what I find interesting in music was uh, the fact that it's something similar to a second language, uh, something that you can practice and learn and uh, you have some phrases, some movements and so on. And indirectly, this led me to um, begin working and studying uh, programming, which is also another kind of language. And I found some similarities between programming and music, which um, made it quite easy for me to begin working with, within programming. Uh, fast forward a few years, and uh, after working with web technologies in 2017, I began working with blockchain technologies. So it was the time where the hype was high, and uh, not that it's not high anymore, but the hype was quite high in 2017, and I began working with uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies uh, back then, and I tried to use my experience as a web developer to apply it to uh, blockchain concepts, and so uh, building large-scale applications uh, within the web sphere was not the same as building large-scale large applications within the blockchain ecosystem. So that's where uh, I began encountering uh, various protocols, and one of them was Hyperledger. Uh, back in the days, uh, it was the only um, uh, the only protocol where you could have large scale applications in 2017. And so that's when it, it uh, I began working with Hyperledger as well as other technologies. And I met uh, Jonas and Matt uh, a few months ago. Uh, it's quite recent, actually. And they began to talk to me about their, their projects. And uh, I, I became really interested because it appealed to my, uh, to my childhood with uh, the, the beginning of the uh, piano lessons that I had. And so that's why I, I became involved in it. That's right. Uh, well, <clears throat> I am a musician and I write music and I produce records and I've, that's been my work my whole life actually. And uh, my passion is to combine and experiment with different kinds of music. So uh, in the 90s, I connect my folk music uh, experiences with pop and rock. I love both parts and I love every kind of music. But at the time, at that time, I, I found a singer and we started a band and it called Nordman and it, we wrote music and released an album and became the most successful band in Sweden, actually, in the 90s. So I've been through a big journey of combining different kind of music and that's still what I love with music to explore different kind of things. I actually been touring in in this in the United States with a, a guy Joe Bonamassa if you, if it's familiar with you guys uh, blues guitarist. So I also work co combine my folk music with blues and um, work pretty well I must say uh, so and I, I'm running a, a, a label a small record company as well uh, called folk pop 
that says pretty much about what it's about. And uh, I'm very curious about finding new ways of release music because the landscape of the business today is quite different than it was before when I started to work with this. So I can see this blockchain and all this uh, about that could be something really good for music. That's what I believe. And it's a lot more to explore and find out about it. So that's why we started up this idea and to, to find out what to do with it. Thanks, guys. Uh, so we'll share a bit about um, what what the whole thing snow drive and played for would uh, that should work i think let me know if it doesn't work um so i will first talk a bit about snow driver and then the method we call play forward snow driver got started with a conversation between mats and myself uh and uh where we concluded that there is a need for something new in the music space really as a professional music, as Mats uh, portrayed, uh, uh, he saw a big problem with the way the centralized platforms are making it increasingly difficult to get a fair share of the pie as a musician. And with my background as a strategic brand developer, I saw a need for renewed creativity and reconnecting with my inner child, as I mentioned before. Uh, and we noticed uh, the potentiality in blockchain-based solutions and, and NFTs in particular. Uh, and grounded in a love for music, we agreed that we would love to bring creativity and change into the music space. And we summed up our ambitions into th these three pillars that we wanted it to be creative, decentralized, and easy to use so that everyone, not just not just the, ma the major corporations uh, are able to use it. And um, we put the name Snowdriver on a project. So Snowdriver was a Snowdriver. Well, it's Snowdriva actually in Swedish, which means uh, Snowdrift, which is hugely fun to play in and uh, which fits our intent. Plus that we believe uh, that the name works pretty well in English as well. And uh, Mats has an in-depth experience of the music industry with a lifelong career as a musician and producer. Uh, I could add my own journey to the mix, not least strategic brand development. And when we connected with Hugo, we got a really cool triad here. And with his expertise in blockchain development, uh, we, we now think that we have uh, some, something strong to build on and with a love for music as a uniting vision. So the essence of Snowdriver is co-creativity and decentralization. While the traditional music industry is mostly linear in its fashion, with middlemen such as streaming platforms and large corporations standing between music creators and their audiences, we want Snowdriver to enable a reshuffling of the cards, so to speak. Um, we don't know yet the exact format of, of Snowdriver. Maybe we'll become a decentralized agency of some sort, building on the creativity. What we do know, though, is that we want to enable new relationships between music creators, investors, and audiences, and encourage uh, co-creativity. We have identified three central conventions um, that we want Snowdriver to be a disruption for. Here is convention uh, number one. Uh, it's our underlying belief that uh, artistry has become a commodity to much extent and a product. And over time, the market becomes over, became oversaturated and there is too little differentiation. The re result is a music scene dominated by a few large corporations where too many artists look the same, sound the same, and distribute their music on a monopolized distribution platforms. So then, <clears throat> and the next convention is 
a core cultural belief that has been building up for quite a while. And that is a, the connection between music and, and fame. There isn't necessarily anything wrong uh, with the quest for fame, obviously, but what was once a music career became 15 minutes of fame famously expressed and even less so today to 15 seconds of fame sometimes. And creativity is now more decentralized than ever, which is kind of weird. And we believe that music carries more than just fame and entertainment is a universal language of human emotions. And we want to explore ways to, to re-encourage that. And thirdly, is about linearity and mediation. Uh, before the dawn of music recording technology, there was only live music after all. And each performance was a little unique and different. Uh, with media and the music record, we got standardization. And with time, music became media. And this created a gap in the distance between musicians and audiences, as well as a gap between writers, composers, musicians, and artists. With the identification of these three conventions, we would like to contribute to six pieces of disruption, at least. So we think we, will, we would like to, to contribute to new stories for music, uh, that there are new stories to be told where music can make a difference and we can expand the universe of, of, of artists, really. And we want to explore what music can become one, once it is free to reinvent new values and stories. We want to reshuffle the cards for music distribution, and that is obviously uh, very much um, um, happening with, with the NFTs and, and DAOs and, and other types of co-production and ownership. Which connects to the next point that we want to encourage co-creation in a non-linear fashion. Why can't more people take part in co-creating music? Uh, and we think that shared ownership of created out outcome is in itself more fair and it uh, creates incentives for co-creation uh, in itself. And why not explore what music could be beyond the standard three minutes of mediated audio. If video killed the radio star, then maybe, maybe NFTs can go beyond the music videos. And that transparency is a way to spark trust and fairness. And this is where we started off with Play It Forward as a, as a first idea, so to speak in order to, to make this, this vision uh, real. And uh, uh, as a first project with Snowdrive, we're creating a solution uh, called Play It Forward. Uh, and Play It Forward is basically a method to connect stakeholders around music production, uh, as well as enable uh, shared ownership of NFTs. Our goal is to build a minting process of fragmented N NFTs, which will offer musicians, songwriters, artists, investors, and audiences a decentralized form of shared ownership solution with shared commission. So just to take back the core principle again, where we think this the plate forward is a way to put this basic principle of decentralized de decentralization into practice. Uh, Play Forward is meant to be a method to bring these different stakeholders together. Some of you may remember a novel called Pay It Forward. And it also became a Hollywood, big Hollywood hit 
movie was about a boy uh, who starts a chain reaction of good deeds. The idea behind paying it forward is that whenever you benefit of a good deed, you let others participate by doing a random good deed to others instead of repaying the benefactor. We were inspired by this. It was a great movie as well, I thought. And Play Forward uh, works in a similar way. Anyone can create the first NFT and pass it on to someone else who adds to the creative solution, making the NFT co-owned. And by each step of creative add-ons, the ownership is shared between all stakeholders and offered for sale in any NFT gallery. And we think that the result can then become a dynamic and fragmented NFT process for cross-creative music production. And um, what can that be used for? You might want to know. And uh, so we're thinking there are quite a few interesting applications. And uh, it could open up many different pathways uh, and uh, hopefully in more ways than, than, uh, than we can imagine here. But, uh, but these are some of, of, of the applications that we would like to encourage and we could see happening. Obviously, the first one, co-production of music. So uh, new and different collaboration between uh, creators and audiences and investors potentially as well. Uh, Co-ownership of music, so we can uh, make a fair, open, transparent uh, commission of, uh, of the system. We also believe that um, in the name of creativity that we could mix genres in, in different and new ways not only for music actually, uh, but maybe for all sorts of, of creative output. Maybe we can see new combinations of, of creativity. And just like we have seen uh, in other cases, actually, there uh, are interesting ways for uh, creating uh, different kinds of VIP access admission where there is a utility built into the NFT uh, as well. Um, and as the Play It Forward network grows, it can enable network effects when it comes to communication. And I think we can see a, a huge, a lot of synergy being built around uh, the creative output once the different stakeholders have come, uh, come together and see that it, that it can become fair and, and uh, transparent. Um, it's also interesting to consider that music and art production can become more fluid, uh, sort of in a constantly evolving state rather than fixed and ready once and for all, uh, which was obviously uh, what we pointed out in, in the convention there with the mediation of music created standards for music. It doesn't have to be that way. And we also believe that Play It Forward can encourage unorthodox collaborations and pop up constellations of participants. So it can become more um, short term fun and uh, interesting in, in some kind of way. <laughs> and, uh, and last here, that play it forward can be a way to pay it forward by including underserved audiences into the mix. And this is where I pass on to Hugo, who will tell us a little about the tech stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know how technical the, the audience is, so I'm going to, to try to, to, to um, yeah, not go into too, too much details in, in any case, and I would, I would confuse you. Um, so basically, the, the question was, how do we build a platform that is 
that is um, easily accessible in a way. Um, but also, um, I, when I mean accessible, I mean uh, accessible to, to any kind of uh, users. So whether they are tech savvy or maybe uh, not so tech savvy. And, and if you want to have a broad audience, uh, you need to have a lot of uh, UX, user experience uh, design. And you need to have uh, an easy to use um, platform, which is uh, which which uh, will most likely hide most of the technical parts that are on the blockchain side, but you will also want to um, yeah, so yeah so so I'm going to try to answer uh, the, the the question uh, Robert uh, in in the, the storage, but so to to answer to the to to this challenge of having both. Uh, uh, an easy to use platform as well as a decentralized platform. Uh, we are going to have to put in place an, uh, an architecture that is the one that you see there, uh, with, um, uh, which is a, a bit more complex than just a full uh, decentralized application. We need to have an architecture that is uh, central, in some way centralized to address the uh, UX uh, issues that we will encounter, for instance, uh, to address users that don't want to manage uh, wallets, uh, users that don't want to see that there is some uh, NFTs behind the scene. The, so, so we need to have a, a platform that is easy to use for any kind of user. But we also need to be able to prove the transparency and the decentralization of the platform. So that's where we need to have some uh, blockchain aspects as well. Um, so the architecture that we've uh, come up with is a, a semi-centralized, semi-decentralized architecture where there is um, uh, part uh, which is there the the back end the api uh, related to the message queue the transactions worker and so on that will uh, mirror the blockchain uh, the blockchain data and when i when i say mirror i say you will uh, interact with the application as if it was a centralized application but everything will be replicated on a blockchain um, and we are trying to have um, something that is quite agnostic in terms of in terms of uh, technology. So um, we have begun working with uh, Tezos technology, for instance, because we need to have some way of uh, transparency as well as scalability and uh, low fees. But uh, we will also be able to uh, to take this architecture and put it on another blockchain, whether it's Hyperledger Bezu, for instance. Um, and this is where uh, Hyperledger could be interesting. It's in the way that if we have uh, something like Hyperledger Bezu, we can have a smart contract that is um, uh, easy to use, easy to access, that will allow us to mirror uh, quite rapidly uh, the transactions that we will then maybe anchor on the public blockchain, such as Ethereum. As to how we will we will store the media on the uh, on the blockchain, uh, that is where IPFS uh, comes in. So IPFS is a decentralized storage solution that you can call from any uh, protocol in the blockchain, and. So we will also obviously mirror the, uh, the music and video files, but they will also be able to be stored on IPFS, which makes them accessible to any uh, user, in, in the, uh, which makes them accessible to any user, even though uh, the platform is not online, for instance, uh, you are able to, to, to access the media uh, through IPFS. Um, so, Having a, a semi-centralized, semi-decentralized uh, architecture allows us to leverage the use cases that we can find in blockchain technologies, such as the transparency, uh, the, um, uh, the transparency, the transfer of value, the modelization of value, the NFTs, and so on. Um, and this is really key for the uh, for the project because we will need to have something that is uh, usable by uh, inexperienced uh, users, as well as uh, transparent and fully auditable to, um, for a more experienced users that have uh, the, the experience of uh, blockchain technologies. Um, back to you, Jonas. I think we can take some uh, questions. 
Great, thank you, Hugo. And uh, yeah, last page, just a thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's where we are. So it's a uh, so it's a it's a cultural um, thing on the one hand, and and the tangible product on the other. And we're trying to uh, find better ways to reinvent uh, the ways we appreciate music, really. I'll stop there. We have and, a couple of questions, questions here. Um, Jonas, I, uh, I just want, I'll take one from the, uh, the chat here, if you guys are ready for uh, some questions. Absolutely. Are you all in conversation? This is from Sassy Black. Are you all in conversation with any other blockchain music platforms? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, and we, uh, we have compared uh, different solutions. Currently, we have been in uh, uh, the most deepest uh, connected with the Tesos uh, and explored their uh, permissionless uh, uh, blockchain. Uh, and obviously, for in comparison to some other uh, permissionless uh, platforms, their their transactions are uh, are pretty decent. And uh, maybe Hugo, you can say something about the uh, tech tech comparisons that we have conducted. Uh, yeah. So basically, there there is here the the blockchain layer, right, which is the protocol, uh, and so. Then there are also there is also some uh, other tools that have been built on those protocols. So maybe maybe that's what you meant by blockchain music platforms. But um, it's interesting to to be able to build your own um, your own solution on top of a protocol, and that's why we are trying to be agnostic, because which is interest. What what's interesting in uh, in the project for us is mostly uh, the fragmented NFT approach. Uh, so the way that you have uh, where you can um, modelize the uh, intellectual property where you have co-creation, uh, this is something that is key and that we are trying to provide uh, to uh, as many actors as possible. Uh, so oh, we have, we have a, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jonas. We have a I, clarification I wanted... on that question yeah. there from yeah. Sassy. Uh, she, uh, uh, or he, uh, I meant to have you been in contact with platforms on ETH, like Catalog, Sound, XYZ, Zora, Mint Songs, or the company I work for, R. Peggy Labs. She, excuse me, thank you. We have uh, not been in, in contact with specifically those platforms. No, we'll, but we would love to, uh, if possible. Uh, we have a, a, a few relationships, both on Ethereum and Tezos, and uh, and we're we're seeing ourselves as something that can sort of be in between those platforms, uh, and uh, would love to explore relationships for sure. I've put the uh, information up for uh, Jonas, Matts, and uh, Hugo on the uh, chat here. So you guys have, uh, I think, their website as well as their uh, LinkedIn profiles. I think I have a question here from Sashin for Hugo, and that is, is IPFS same as database tier in your architecture? Um Thanks for the question. No, it's not exactly the same thing. Um, so the, the database tier is mostly, uh, it can be a, a SQL or NoSQL database, such as MySQL or PostgreSQL or MongoDB and so on. It's basically to store the metadata of the, um, of the, of the platform as well as the user information, because we will need, if you want to have some uh, uh, broad UX, uh, we, we need to have uh, a database to store the user data, such as uh, username, uh, password, and so on. So um, this is where the database comes in. It is, it is also to mirror some of the metadata from the blockchain uh, aspects, such as uh, 
uh, who minted uh, which NFT and uh, what is the relationship between the NFTs and so on. Um, the, uh, the IPFS storage is more like a file storage uh, platform. So we will have some mirror of that as well, but the IPFS is the decentralized aspect of the uh, media storage. So basically that's where we will store uh, the video files, the sound files and so on. Uh, another question from uh, Sharin. So in simple terms, you tend to create an NFT-based marketplace for artists to sell music video, which will eliminate the media production houses? Um, uh, in short, yes. <laughs> but uh, the longer answer is, nah, not really. I mean, those are, I mean, we're not trying to eliminate anyone, really. But uh, we want to encourage and, and enable uh, um, co-creativity that is not defined by the media or the pro production houses uh, as they are uh, constructed uh, currently in the music industry. So uh, we see it more like a parallel sort of landscape where we're not trying to compete with the music industry, we're trying to create something parallel to it where, um, where something new is uh, possible to happen in the first place. While we're on that, I have a question. Um... Well, there's a couple more questions in the chat, but I have a question while we're on that topic of uh, uh, eliminating the, uh, the the middlemen, as we'll call it. Uh, a lot of the success in uh, music and uh, film, television uh, is is created by many of the middlemen, the marketers, the distribution houses, and the money that goes into that, the investors, et cetera, et cetera. As we decentralize music, film, TV, and we start to share that. Uh, do you see any sort of uh, change in how people view how much they want to invest in these projects if they're not going to get the returns, the ROI that uh, uh, that they're so accustomed to? So, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the the some of the big names are selling their entire portfolios to some of the big guys, and they're just going to go out and make tons of money for the next hundred years. And the, the artist got one big lump sum. So that's not going to happen in decentralized music. It's not going to happen in NFTs. It's going to happen only in the, we'll call it the legacy uh, format of, of, of music. So what are your guys' thoughts on that sort of thing and how some of the missing parts may have some impact on the success of music? Good question. And uh, so, um I, I don't think that is necessarily anything wrong with, with that, those kinds of solutions, that's fine. Uh, but I, I see that sort of as an end cry to something, sort of sell it off in a bunch of make a lot of money, then you're done with it. It's, it's not about creating something new or more, uh, more alive, new, cre new creativity and more different solutions. So um, uh, if anything, if 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 that uh, approach works, so that's fine. But we, uh, again, I see it. We see it as a sort of a parallel approach, where uh, we we can create something more interesting to the audiences, and uh, what kind of business models that might might emerge out of that will be interesting to see. And we think that fragmented NFTs is a very good input for for uh, reinventing the business models around it. Um. Uh, in terms of, of how the industry might react, actually, I'm going to pass that on to Mats because maybe you have the most deepest experience of the, the music, traditional music uh, uh, industry. And I, I know that you see a lot of, of things moving there as well. You're muted now. Well, as you say, I, I don't think we should co compete with, with uh, the other parts of the business with this idea. Uh, but I believe uh, new kind of uh, co collaboration will, will, uh, will appear uh, with this new method with fragmented 
NFTs, as you say. So, well, I can just see uh, possibilities. And perhaps we could add to that, uh, uh, we do have a, a problem with the centralized platforms as it is, because it's somewhat difficult for a lot of, of musicians to be, um, to make a living. Excellent point, uh, and all you guys. Uh, I see that, and I, Matt, I, I, I do see the. Uh, uh, it's a different. Uh, it's a different venue altogether. I think is what. Uh, uh, and you're not going to compete with the with the legacy. Uh, we have another question here from Bastian. I think is the name uh, regarding musician payments. Do you plan on building some smart contracts for it to be simplified and automated? If so. Would you offer this solution for Web2 streaming platforms, for example, to make sort of a transition between Web2 and Web3? Brilliant question. And uh, uh, you're exactly right. That, what, that is a venue we are exploring and we are having conversations with, um, with a platform like that. And uh, I think it is an excellent way to transition into Web3, uh, building on on a traditional, more traditional sort of, of Patreon-like uh, platforms, for example. Um, and um, regarding smart contracts, yes. Uh, uh, so the the minting process itself is is a smart contract. So the you, you have a decentralized uh, minting process for the fragmented NFTs, and uh, those can. If we do it in a clever way, we will be able to use, like uh, Hugo said, that we will be able to have an API that will uh, we can connect to any different kind of gallery or platform, be it uh, web through web two or web three. So we have a another question: How will marketing of such music on? on your platform happen as in traditional music industry is done by those middlemen, which are not in the version of your music industry. Mm. Uh, yes, and uh, this is where we believe that uh, we, we can create networks effects and synergy effects in new and hopefully unexpected ways. When, when audiences and creators and uh, all types of shareholders uh, come together both to, both to co-produce but also co-own. I think we create uh, um, mini ecosystems in themselves, which is an excellent platform for marketing. So it's not a, the idea is not uh, sort of the traditional um, linear marketing strategy pushing something out, but rather having uh, those relationships um, become become more intimate and um, uh, we believe that is smart marketing actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and now I've just to piggyback on that question. Um, how have you been received by the industry? Um, uh, I would say leaders in terms of the business, in terms of the, the, um, the audience and the musicians and the artists. How well has your, pro your, your program, your platforms been received by those various audiences? Yeah, good question, and that that um, remains to be seen, actually, because we're right in the in the process of of, of um, connecting with these properly, the, these audiences, and learn from them and see how we can create value to them, and also exploring how the decentralized agency of Snowdriver can be become a home uh, for for these kinds of, of people who would like to see a, a disruption of the not necessarily of the in music industry, but disruption on music itself. And uh, I think, um, um, and we hope uh, and we believe that uh, this can be utilized by a lot of people. And while we aim to for, for Snowdriver to become uh, some kind of decentralized DAO based entity, uh, we're we're not we're not seeing uh, played forward necessarily as anything more than an open source method. And we hope more people will join in and contribute and uh, uh, bring this solution further. 
We have another question from uh, Sharanch. So you mentioned Hyperledger and Tezos. So are you considering permissioned and permissionless platforms or a combination of both, like Tezos for NFT marketplace and Hyperledger to add transparency and security in some way? That's good. Uh, yeah. Good question. Um, so for the, um, we, we are actually considering, a, um, so that's where the semi-centralized solution uh, comes in. So uh, we are considering a, an, an architecture where we would have the uh, mirror of the data on the Hyperledger Bezu. And so basically uh, something like uh, that, that is permissioned um, and then be able to anchor some of those data on, uh, on the Ethereum. Through, through a bridge. So that's one of the solutions that we are considering. Uh, the other one is more uh, on the on the uh, uh, permissionless platforms. So that's where uh, Tezos uh, would come in. And uh, so the, um, uh, this is indeed uh, a good platform for the NFTs, uh, where you have multiple marketplaces and standards that are already available. Uh, that would uh, allow us to, to be able to, to sell uh, and to have more uh, uh, value proposition solutions for the, uh, for the artists. And maybe we, we have, oh. a, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jones. And maybe we can just add that uh, it's really up to the creators and the stakeholders uh, to show us the way how they want to co combine and bridge uh, uh, the uh, different solutions. And if they see uh, there might be sometimes needs for uh, permission-based solutions and sometimes a permissionless is better or a combination, uh, it's really up to the solution. Uh, we have uh, another question from Bazin. Do you plan on selling NFTs to be used as a licensing catalog? For example, music supervisors? Uh, that is also a very good question, and we uh, it's always always so far we have realized that it's it's tricky <laughs> to to deal with licensing, and it, we need to tread carefully there. Uh, and uh, so I I I, I th I'd see ourselves uh, using um, um, other other kinds of solutions rather than than licensing catalogs but it could definitely happen I, I don't have a better question than that I'm sorry or a better answer than that sorry. from no. Nike uh, Schmidt uh, how do you technically fractionalize an NFT example how do you tokenize the shares in the song Hugo question yeah, sorry. Um, so basically, the, um, the the fractionalization of the uh, NFT is mostly a way to um, identify who authored what in the song. So uh, to 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 take an example, uh, if I'm building a, a simple melody with my guitar. Uh, and I create an NFT about that. But uh, then there is some uh, uh, pop singer that wants to, to add a, a song on top of that. And so the, the pop singer takes my NFT uh, and creates a new NFT that re refers to the first one. So there is some fractionalization, not in the NFT as, uh, as uh, such, but there is a fractionalization on the uh, revenue stream that will be directly sent to the, uh, to the NFT chain, basically, that you will have on, on this side. Uh, if there is another artist that wants to take the same guitar riff, but uh, put it within an electro song, for instance, uh, then it will create, the, the, the artist will create uh, an NFT, a new NFT with the, the first NFT as well. And if uh, there is some people that buy this song, 50-50 uh, or depending on the contracts that we will build, but let's say it's 50-50, and 50% 50, 50, um, uh, 50 will go to the uh, original artist with the riff, uh, with the guitar riff, and 50% will go to the uh, electronic music artist that will uh, create the, the rest of the song. Um, 
Yeah, exactly. So that that is a co-ownership and uh, dividing the shares of revenue. But what what we have in the uh, in the NFT is basically a, a NFT chain. Uh, so it's not on the NFT, but fractionalization goes to the revenue. And based in for the, um, I'm sorry, no, I was on the other question, but I will say, I will let uh, maybe Jonas answer this one. From uh, Vipal is how will you control the cost of such NFTs? I mean, if you t if too many parties are involved in in a voluntary manner to produce this music, will there be a policy of controlling price? No. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Sharanch, so fractionalization is basically not the direct value, but sort of co-ownership and then dividing shares of revenue. Yeah, so, so that's what, uh, yeah, that's exactly this. Any other and questions? Is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Randy, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh no, it's okay. I was just going to ask, um, then um, how would that be done in terms of dividing the um, co-ownership? Would that be done through the um, smart contracts? Um, like exactly how, I mean, not to go into a really deep in-depth um, explanation, but just kind of a general idea on how that would be done to, on a technical level. Here we go. What do you? So, so, sorry, I didn't. I didn't get the question. Um, like, would how would you um, do the fractionalization? Um, okay. Would you create a, a separate token um, to sort out the ownership and be able to? Um, divide up the shares of revenue. In your example, if you say like if you had someone sample a riff, um, mm. exactly how how would that? Yeah. So, so so that would be uh, so that would be on the NFT smart contract. Um, basically, the um, the initial NFT uh, emitter would say if you want to, to use my creation uh, as your as your nft you can use it to up to x, x percent of uh, revenue sharing uh, and this will go down as well so basically um all right i'm i'm creating a, a, a guitar riff I'm, as it's a simple guitar riff uh, i don't want to to um, and i and since i want to, to people to use my riff uh, i will say that uh, since it's just a guitar if you can use this as up to five to ten percent uh, revenue sharing so using this riff you can choose which percentage you, you want between five and ten, and ten percent that's the low and the upper range um, then the, the the next creator will take my uh, nft and say okay there is five to ten percent my new nft is maybe just a baseline on top of this guitar riff uh, I think it goes well with it. I create a new baseline. Uh, I think my creation is worth maybe 10 to 15 percent of the next NFTs that will use the guitar riff plus the uh, the plus the, uh, the the baseline and so on and so on. Um, and if I want to say, okay, my, my NFT uses uh, if you want to reuse the the, the NFT, it's a uh, hundred percent of of revenue stream. So the 100 percent is um, divided at least by two then because if I, I have some creations at, at least divided by two but yeah, that, that's uh, so, so with the NFT chain I put on the NFT smart contract the percentage of revenue stream that will go to and then when the NFT uh, is paid uh, because it's used in, uh, in any way uh, when the NFT is paid then it will divide accordingly Mm -hmm. to the, to the NFT chain. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Regarding, uh, we have another question from Bazin regarding the in, uh, the music NFT in itself as files a share a size is limited for NFTs. How do you plan on selling 
the best audio quality possible as the file size might be too much to be, become an NFT. Yeah, so that's um, the, the IPFS storage is limited indeed. And um, so that's where the file size comes in. And there, there is multiple ways to tackle that. And to be honest, we didn't choose one yet. Um, but one of the ways that we will probably begin with is by the uh, through the mirroring of uh, media. So in this case, I think we will store on the platform, not directly on the IPFS storage, but on the platform, we'll store the, uh, the maximum version of the, the top one. Uh, and we will try to, 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 to secure storage. Uh, so basically have backups and so on. Um, and then we will store a lower version on the IPFS storage so that we can have uh, something that is a proof of the IP, basically. But if you want to have higher quality, then you can go to the platform, get the higher quality. So that's the way that is semi-centralized, and I know it's not ideal. Um, another way to do that would be to split uh, the file across multiple IPFS storages. But in this case, it would cost a bit more and would be probably harder to, to, to manage. So that's something that we have to consider. And maybe by the time we come to this, um, the technology uh, will have improved and we'll be able to store those files anyway. Well, we're, we're at our uh, one hour here, and I think that was a pretty outstanding presentation, Jonas, Matt, and Hugo. And uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, taking the time to uh, put this on. And... Uh, Will you uh, will you come back in a couple few months and uh, and uh, or six months and show us what uh, your progress is? Can we can we count on that? And everybody here can uh, get an invite to that event. I'd love to. <laughs> that thank sounds you. outstanding. Thank you for having us. You're very welcome, and thank you for taking the time to uh, to a great presentation. We've got the recording here. It'll be up on the uh, uh, on the wiki. So anybody that uh, is participating today, I put a link into our wiki and ask that you uh, have a look at that. Maybe connect with us. And we're, we're, there's also a link to the Discord there. We'd love to see you guys there as well. Uh, and uh, jump in the music one. We'll put a a copy of the video up on Discord, so you'll see uh, everything there. And Matt, that was some cool. Uh, instrument that you have there i wanted to just clarify you made that yourself yeah i, I build instruments uh that, yeah that's right. unreal 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 mm -hmm. i have a mm -hmm. personal friend of mine in canada that makes guitars i'm going to send him that uh i'll send him that video he's uh he's uh he's he's going to be totally impressed but thank you Thank you all again, Randy. Did you have something you wanted to say to everybody? Thank you all for coming. I just wanted to reiterate, thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much to Jonas and Matt and Hugo. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, all. We'll see you and talk to you again. See ya. Yes. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.